Good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, I'm very excited about this plenary, and I'm excited about the workshop that it's part of. This, um, the research we're going to be talking about both during the plenary and throughout this workshop, I think is super important. In fact, I think it's one of the most important issues we're dealing with today in society, which is toxicity a lot online, especially around race and gender. So I am personally gratified because this is an area I study that we're bringing these scholars together to talk about it. I'm also super excited because we're bringing scholars from different areas, which is so important because it's very easy in academia to just keep reading your own stuff and your friend's stuff. And I had such a so much uh, such a pleasure reading everybody's articles on this because I found out new scholars that I'm interested in and new areas that I want to tackle. So I'm super excited um, to introduce our plenary panel, but before I do that, I want to give you a little sense of the way this is going to work. So I am going to introduce each of our speakers. They will speak for a short period of time, 10 to 15 minutes, and then I'm going to be moderating some questions to them and asking them some questions. And then you all will have a chance to answer, to ask questions. Um, are we all set with mics, everybody? All right. So first, I would like to just introduce our panel, and then we'll start getting started with their speaking. So first, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Zizi Papagirizi. She is professor and head of the communications department and also a professor in political science at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, her research focuses on social and political consequences of online media. She has published nine books, over 30, 70 journal articles and book chapters, and she serves on the editorial boards of 15 journals. She's also the former editor of Journal of Broadcasting Electronic Media, and the founding and current editor of Social Media and Society. She's currently working on her 10th book, After Democracy, with Yale University Press. So if we can all welcome her. Thank you. I would also like to um, introduce you to Dr. Lisa Nakamura. She is professor at the University of Michigan. She holds appointments in American culture, screen arts and cultures, and women's studies departments. Her research interests include Asian American studies, feminist theory, digital game theories, and race and gender in new media. Dr. Nakamura has written or co-edited four books about race, identity, and the internet, and she serves on the editorial boards of 10 journals. Please welcome her to our panel. And I'd also like to introduce you to Dr. Catherine Knight Steele. She is an assistant professor of communication at the University of Maryland. She's also the first project director of Maryland's Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded College of Arts and Humanities grant, Synergies Among Digital Humanities and African American History and Culture. Her research targets topics including race, gender, digital cultures, new media, and online social justice. Please welcome Dr. Steele. And now I'm going to invite Dr. Papacherizzi to speak. And when you're done, just join us back at the panel. And okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure for me to be back at UT Austin. Um, thank you all for your wonderful hospitality. Thank you to the SSRC for bringing together this event with um, Talia Stroud, with Gina Chen. Um, and thank you as well to the Moody College and the School of Journalism for hosting this wonderful event. It, it's a pleasure. I'm in such good company with this plenary panel and I think in this room in general. Um, so I'm going to start by telling a story and then I'll talk about the form of news that I think um, leads to toxicity online. I call this effective news and then I will talk about um, this construct I, I've developed um, called Affective Publics, and I'll wrap up with some um, recommendations on how we might be able to address um, the problem of toxicity as journalists and also as citizens. So a few years ago, I, um, I embarked on a, a line of research that 
held many surprises for me, <laughs> but was also quite fulfilling. Um, it was designed to understand how Twitter functions as a platform for new storytelling, and this was around 2010. Uh, Twitter was a, was a different medium then, and it supported, it supported mostly community-oriented conversation among friends with a little bit of snark. Um, it was this peculiar blend of mass, broadcast, polyphonic communication that emerged out of mostly one-to-one -one dyadic conversations, and I think that's why it was so appealing to um, uh, some of us. There was a lot of speculation about how news organizations might use it, and there was also a lot of speculation about how citizens might put it to work. And then came um, the Arab Spring uh, and the Indignados movement and Occupy and showed us the part that Twitter could play in helping tell the stories of movements that media, mainstream media institutions, were not prepared to understand. So there was a lot of talk back then about whether social media, and, and mainly Twitter, made these revolutions. And what a useless conversation that was, really, because, <laughs> uh, because change is gradual. And uh, in the words of Raymond Williams, revolutions are long, uh, and they have to be long in order to attain meaning. Uh, and sometimes they lead away from and not toward democracy, as we have seen. So no, social media did not make those revolutions, but the revolutions made um, social media because Twitter and many other platforms definitely attained uh, uh, a different <coughs> character post those movements. And in so doing, they reinforced this brand of news that I, I call effective. Uh, what is effective news? It emerged for us as we studied crowdsourced, bottom-up, live tweeted, curated, swarm fact-checked streams of news that took over news storytelling um, during the Arab Spring and many of the movements that followed it. Affective news is a mix of live tweeted news reports, drama, fact, opinion, all blended into one to the point where we can't really discern one from the other and doing so kind of sort of misses the point. It is not new, but it is amplified by social media. What is affect, and why do I term this brand of news affective? Well, affect is not the same as emotion. Um, it is the intensity with which we feel. I don't have a problem with emotion in journalism, and I, I don't want to talk about emotion in journalism either. What I'm interested more is intensity in journalism, uh, and intensity in conversation, because I find that is what invites toxicity. So in our work, uh, these were not emotional news reports that we were reading. I mean, sure, they were filled with emotion. What human conversation doesn't have emotion within it? But they were not emotional. Affect is the sensation that you feel before you experience an emotion and before your cognitive mechanisms kick in and help you label that sensation as an emotion. So when you tap your foot to a song that you like, that's an affective reaction. Uh, when you hum a song, that is also a type of an affective reaction. What does affective news look like then? Uh, it's um, short, report-like, with some opinion thrown in there, some drama as well. Usually in about less than two, 200 characters, and above all, it is intense. Affect is not feeling. It is about the intensity with which we feel. It's the difference between me poking you versus pushing you, versus shoving you to the ground. But think of it otherwise. It's the difference between a caress to the cheek versus a slap, all right? It's the same gesture, but applied with different intensity. It reveals a different intention. It leads to a completely different impact. And so how did we get from that, <laughs> uh, from the Arab Spring to Trump? How did we get from the caress to the slap to the face. Um, what President Trump delivers is effective news. It's effective news friendly. It's a blend of facts, uh, drama, opinion, and intensity blended into one. The problem is, is not only is it delivered, but it is reported as news because news organization have, organizations have taken to the habit of 
uh, reporting uh, the president's uh, tweets as gospel, a habit that they took on during the primaries and have yet to drop. Uh, news media also produce effective news. And here's the thing, affect intensity is not the event. It is a way for citizens to sense their way into a story. Things become problematic when affect, when this intensity is reported as the event. And then we get tweets that automatically become headlines with no fact checking, no editorial acumen exercised. Uh, we hear one liners about Hillary's emails filled with alarming intensity but never get to hear what was in those emails. We hear a lot about uh, Bernie Sanders' plan for free um, education, Senator Warren's plan to forgive college debt, AOC's new green plan, but never more detail. And these one-liners are repeated over and over again as refrains, as choruses that lull us into agreement or indignation. So you see, we're forced into these binary these opposite positions that invite toxicity. There's very little in between. Um, so these lull us into agreement or indignation to the point where we produce affective reactions of our own. Uh, what are some examples of that? We mute the channels, we just turn the news off, we block, we gesture at the TV, we turn it off. Affect, this form of intensity, can be very successful in sustaining feelings of community. And these feelings of community can be very important in reflexively driving a movement forward, as we have seen with Me Too, as we have seen with Black Lives Matter. Or they can entrap publics in a state of engaged passivity, as we see with MAGA. So a lot of intensity, but no movement. A lot of intensity with absolutely no moving forward at all. Well, that, to me, is the definition of toxicity. And it's also you know, a civic nightmare to be trapped into. Now, how does affective publics uh, relate into this? Well, I understand affective publics as networked publics that come together, are identified, or are disbanded through expressions of sentiment. Um, they are unique, and they have distinct and therefore, they have distinct digital imprints. This may sound like a sort of, you know, Captain Obvious point to make, but I want to emphasize it because all too often uh, we look at the social media presence that one movement has attained, and we assume that other movements will be able to attain that same texture, that same type, that same form of social media presence. Um, and that's not the case. Every movement is unique. Every movement has, it own, has its own um, digital imprint. Um, Egypt, um, some of the movements associated with the Arab Spring, they had a very specific and strict curational hierarchy uh, to them that produced a particular narrative for the movement. Occupy, uh, on the other hand, was driven by heterarchy, by the desire to not elevate anybody to prominence because the point of that movement was different. It was to provide an opportunity for um, everyone to stand up and be counted. And I've said before that were it not for the Occupy movement, we would not be able to um, have candidates like uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, AOC. We would not be able to have the conversations that we are having today about you know, reining in um, or coming up with a version of softer capitalism that can support stronger democracy. Uh, affective publics are enabled by uh, connective action, not collective action. So there's no overarching uh, authority that decides how the story is going to be told. As a result, the narratives, the stories that emerge online about these movements tend to be a little bit fragmented, especially if there's not strong figures doing, uh, strong uh, leading figures doing the curating. Um, and so because these, these narratives are sometimes fragmented, and that's part of how these movements operate online, there's nothing wrong with that, they do tend to invite toxicity. Um, again, here we see differences. Me Too repelled toxicity through some very tight curating mechanisms, so through some collaborative uh, connective mechanisms. Uh, 
Occupy was not able to do the same. Uh, affective publics are powered by effectively driven statements that blend. They will blend fact, news, drama, opinion all into one. They enable disruption. Uh, they also enable presencing of that which was previously less visible. But as movements scale up, that visibility invites solidarity, yes, but it also invites toxicity. Uh, and finally, I want to emphasize that for affective publics, their impact is going to be symbolic. The agency that they're going to afford is going to be discursively accessed. It's going to involve the semantic renegotiation of key terms, of taking phrases like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and infusing them with a particular kind of meaning. Um, and the power that's access is liminal, is ephemeral, transitional, evanescent. Uh, I emphasize this because all too often we expect these movements to have impact that's instantaneous, political, legislative, social, cultural. Um, and when it's not, we're disappointed. Uh, but it's not the movements that have let us down. It's not just our media, our politicians, our institutions that have let us down either. It's our own expectations uh, that have misled us because change is gradual. And in order to change our institutions, we have to go through this process where we um, collaboratively uh, reimagine them and renegotiate them first. We will never um, rid ourselves completely of toxic environments. As long as we have conversations, we will have some toxic comments. As long as we socialize, we will encounter toxic people. There are things, however, that we can do so as to not elevate toxicity to prominence, so that we do not add fuel to the fire. And I will mention um, just two for now. For journalists, what to do, for instance, with President Trump and the toxicity of conversation that surrounds his persona? What journalists in other countries who find themselves dealing with oppressive regimes that restrict their freedom and manipulate their access do? Unite. You know, Jay Rosen said a while ago, uh, shortly after President Trump was elected, send your interns to the pressers because there's not going to be a whole lot of information coming out of the press rooms. Have your experienced people do the investigative work. There's a wonderful book out called Democracy's Detectives by James Hamilton. Be democracy's detectives, journalists. Um, you are truth finders. You're not storytellers. Resist the tyranny of the narrative, which forces us to come up with characters, with drama, with plot twists, which rewards toxicity. You are truth finders who work with storytelling media. And for citizens, we are the storytellers. We are the sense makers. We tell stories to make sense of things, of who we are, how we fit into this world. In an attention economy, our attention is a powerful commodity. It's our path to agency. We must choose how we focus our attention, not squander it to clickbait headlines that reward toxicity. Um, play hard to get. Let's not be cheap dates. <laughs> Um, our attention is our power. So in the end, technologies network us yet. Yes, uh, we are network publics, but it is our stories that connect us, identify us, and potentially disconnect us. And journalists, I feel, can use technology to give us access to information of a better quality. Uh, they can help us rise above the toxicity. Um, they can give us equal access to that information so that we can tell the stories that identify us, that bring us closer, and that do not divide us. Thank you very much. I look forward to the conversation.
to s I need to look at the laptop so I can see what my slides are going to be. Is that all right? You'll also see them up there if you want. Yeah. Well, I need to see what the next one's going to be. I like to look at the deck and sometimes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you can bring it along. Okay, forward. thank you. Um, so while we're waiting for that to get set up, I want to thank um, the Social Science Research Council, especially Jason Rohde, for putting together this wonderful event and all of the people at the University of Texas, especially um, Gina Chen, who has been in touch with us to make this happen. And it's such a privilege to be having this meeting because um, I've been working on racism and digital media for 20 years. And I honestly was not sure people were going to ever acknowledge that it's a problem. <laughs> so it's wonderful to, um, to acknowledge it, but it's also a, a terrible thing in a way because it shows that it's become so pervasive that people can't ignore it. Right? People who were invested in and wanted to ignore it, I think it's not possible to do that anymore. So I think just as easy was giving some, I think, very excellent advice to journalists to try to ramp down the intensity a little bit, stop feeding um, the toxicity that, which can lead to misogyny and racism. I mean, they overlap. They're not exactly the same. But certainly, you need one to have the other. One is a symptom of the other. Um, what I'm going to be doing is talking to um, programmers and designers and um, people in the tech industry uh, about how they can um, address the questions of toxicity, specifically racism and sexism, in their industries. So um, as Izzy was saying, uh, intensity is not the same as truth. <laughs> you know, uh, In some ways, it's the enemy of truth. And um, what I've been finding is that as the tech industry is trying, um, I think, really frantically and sincerely to rehabilitate itself quickly after 20 years of literally disavowing any connection to these things, saying instead it's users, it's not the platform, it's individual actors, it's not the culture, it was a one-off, it's not the system, right? Um, you can only say that for so long. Uh, I think that tech is actually doubling down on affect and talking very sincerely about the importance of empathy and the importance of storytelling um, and the importance of feeling as a way to um, kind of cut off racism and sexism at the pass, right? Because if you have the right kinds of feelings, you won't make the wrong kinds of things. So I'm going to talk about some of the problems and some of the symptoms of this kind of thinking. Um, the bigger project I'm working on is a short book that will define racism in the context of technology. Because I honestly don't believe that people in the industry know what racism is, and I don't believe they know when they're doing it. And there are some structural reasons for this. Um, Terry McPherson has called this the kind of object-oriented problem, um, object-oriented racism, where people don't know what's inside the objects. They could be databases of criminals. They could be um, cadavers who are being used to train facial recognition systems. They just don't know the contents of the things they're working with, um, which in allows people to work on things and complete them and to do it in a collective way. It does allow, however, um, a kind of unaccountability, uh, ability to disavow the result of what somebody has made. And you know, the Microsoft walkouts are a good example about how programmers are starting to realize that they, are, are, as well, are victims of this kind of design work. But they would like to have more knowledge about what they're making and who it's affecting. Um, so I'm going to pose a solution um, to how I think we can manage this problem. And to do so, I'm going to be dipping back into the 80s and 90s, as I was talking to Catherine on the bus about, um, to talk about women of color feminism specifically, and how it is that this kind of thinking, this um, epistemic disposition, um, can help inform people who may never have read any of it, have not thought about these ideas, um, but are now wanting to detach themselves or distance themselves a little bit from some of the terrible things that big tech has done. So I don't know what's happening with my part. I'm just going to start reading it and right, start talking. I apologize. That's OK. I don't know what's going on with the, the text. Oh, I can read the slide from here. So the title of the talk is, in, OK, now I can't see it. Uh, <laughs> in Search of Race, Understanding Digital. OK. Digital Race. OK, great. Um, I feel like we burned up a bunch of time. So I'm going to um, cut some things. But 
can I, all right, I have this slide advanced, so good. Thank you. So I'm going to take a minute to talk about what I've been doing at, um, at my day job at the University of Michigan, which is to help found a new unit called the Digital Studies Institute. And we are hiring and have a degree program, undergrad degree. It's very popular. So what makes this different from other kinds of institutes that work on technology um, and society, digital media and society, is that we have a specific orientation on race, gender, and identity and power. So um, we came out of the ethnic studies programs at the University of Michigan. American culture is the container for ethnic studies. And so we are very grounded in the kind of ethical, cultural, social, and ethical implications of what tech is doing. So um, I welcome this opportunity to be here because I think it's, it's very in line with the mission of what we are trying to achieve, which is to think broadly about the topic of racism and digital communication. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, women of color, people of color, people who are not normative have experienced intense harassment on the internet since at least the mid-90s. I mean, you know, this is endemic, right? So why is it only now, after decades of disinterest, disavowal, and disbelief that this has finally been seen as a serious social problem? So um, I'm going to talk about some specific tropes. One specific trope that reveals that we have understood this and repressed it and are only now willing to understand it differently. So a term I see a lot in the news is the term the reckoning, <laughs> um, or big tax reckoning. Um, this has been spotted in outlets such as Tim O'Reilly's blog. So that's from Tim O'Reilly. This is from TechCrunch, um, Silicon Valley's Year of Reckoning, 2018. Um, uh, and this is interesting because Tim O'Reilly was the inventor of the term Web 2.0. He was one of the biggest evangelists of the shift to streaming, the shift away from um, software as a, pr a product, but rather as a service. Um, TechCrunch is one of the most well-known Silicon Valley incubators. Uh, if you watch Silicon Valley, the show, they really focus on TechCrunch as a way for new businesses to get started. Um, so these are powerful symbols of the Internet's immunity from critique and its claim to being an exceptional medium that cannot be regulated because it's so dynamic, because it's so emergent, and so on, um, the implication that even former evangelists for big tech can no longer claim that the internet is not toxic. Indeed, this conviction is now seen as a given. It was held in suspense, held in abeyance all this time. The implication was, this was always coming. TechCrunch even knows when the shift occurred, 2018. This was a year that saw a resurgence of public knowledge, on the other hand, about racism and misogyny, as Catherine has researched so well, the, in some ways the resurgence of um, black feminism, women of color feminism, on sites like Tumblr, Twitter, and so on. So as I mentioned before, I believe the tech industry suffers from a terrible lack of knowledge about racism, what it is, when it's happening, um, its effects upon human bodies, um, that is endemic and specific to the industry. So there's some obvious reasons. One, it's still predominantly white men who have built a work culture and a set of platforms that embody their values, which is inevitable. That's what design is. Um, and as I said, I also believe it's totally unintentional. But the most egregious forms of racism in the 21st century are. In the absence of clear definitions of racism and sexism, what else can we expect? Imagining that non-racist software can emerge from a largely unregulated, profit and growth obsessed industry that is not accountable to users is the definition of delusion. <laughs> um, like the tech industry itself, racism is, racism is too big and too immersive, in Tara McPherson's words, to originate in personal, visceral, racist feeling or individual agency as a main driver. So I still believe this is how people imagine racism to work, that it's a held feeling or hatred that pe one person has for another. Um, but I think what we are seeing now is that algorithms continue this work without anyone needing necessarily to be involved, right? So it isn't really about feeling, individual opinion, but rather about systemic um, platforms. So I'm calling this talk In Search of Race for two reasons. Um, first, it's the title of an essay I'm writing for a series by Misan called In Search of Media. 
Um, but secondly, because I see new strategies for routing around discussions of race and misogyny in the midst of this long delayed reckoning about internet toxicity. So I think there, there's a kind of wiggling around, right? There's an accounting for, yes, it happened. We can no longer claim it didn't happen. It's in the paper every single day. Right, so this was just from yesterday. Um, it's happening. You know, there's, there's really no way to deny it. Um, but I think you've, I've seen some strategies come up to, to try and kind of negotiate it, right? Not to face it head on. So um, this reckoning and this routing around enable each other. Because in not acknowledging the problem require, uh, produces a need for empathy and ethics as ways to talk around racism and sexism. So I'm interested in both of these terms as techniques to get around this specific problem. Um, it's precisely because there's such overwhelming evidence that digital culture is racist and sexist by design. Again, I wouldn't say on purpose, but by design, right? Um, the contents of databases, the way that algorithms handle them, the way they address users based on race and gender and class, um, is root and branch the way that algorithms work, right? It's, they're not working badly. This is how they are meant to work. Um, but we see as well new forms of management, impression management, rhetorical management, that skew away from the idea of epistemology, knowledge, what Zizi's calling truth. I'm so glad that it's talking before mine because I think it's brilliant. Um, and towards affect and emotion as individual solutions to collective and cultural problems. So the two terms most often employed to avoid the issue of racism and misogyny in tech are ethics and empathy. And they're both connected to specific kinds of new technologies on the horizon. Um, AI is paired with ethics often. You'll see ethics and AI, the Center for AI and Ethics, and so on. Um, ethics is a branch of philosophy. Philosophy, along with computer science, is the most white and male field in the academy. So this is a match made in heaven. Right? These two things were meant to be together. Right? There's no intrinsic connection between the study of ethics and the study of racism and sexism. In fact, it's a move away from this towards universals. Right? Um, virtual reality, like UX design, is paired with empathy and storytelling. So part of the reckoning is this surge of new centers, conferences, white papers, and institutes on ethics and AI, VR and empathy, rebranding these things as um, uh, feeling-based or, you know, virtual reality is called an empathy machine often. But as I mentioned before, ethics and empathy are not about racism, misogyny, and toxicity. Instead, they're about universal principles, right, or individual sensations. So to return to the matter of intention, I know that Mark Zuckerberg does not know what racism is. I really don't think he does. <laughs> His inability to understand how viewers would perceive his demo, where he was standing using VR, um, the kind of VR Facebook platform, in front of the severe flooding in Puerto Rico as dead animals, people's houses washed down the street, is one vivid example. I mean, you would not do that if you had any idea what racism was, right? Um, or what xenophobia was, or what feelings were in some ways. So this is why Mark Zuckerberg is a huge fan of empathy. Because empathy is a state of feeling or sensing rather than knowing. It's not something that can be taught. It's not something you can learn. It's something that designers create. So there's no need to have a definition of racism or be able to apply it to your everyday life or practice in digital space, and therefore no requirement to teach it or even to talk about it. Right? So it's a way to avoid discourse around it. The beauty of empathy is that you can avoid racism without ever knowing exactly what it is, since your body will sense it. So um, I wanted to throw up this slide. It's a studio I'm studying um, that made a VR piece called My Beautiful Home about Kibera, which is a neighborhood in Africa. And um, what I love about this slide is 2018, but it could be 1999, right? I mean, this is technology's um, exceptionalism as well. Everything is always emergent. Everything is always impossible to regulate, right? Everything is always undefinable and moving too quickly for us to intervene. How can this can be true for 30 years is the hat trick of digital media, right? Um, so uh, this is the new virtual reality. We need it because it emphasizes direct experience where we can decide for ourselves what racism is. And I've seen so many things about how white people need to have empathy, and that's how we will get rid of the problem of racism. It will happen on an individual basis. 
according to Zuckerberg, it will happen using technology. So there are a bunch of titles like this, which you only need to look at a few times to think about and realize this is not how it's going to work. Right? Um, VR does not help you become someone else. Uh, so here's what he has to say about this. So it's important that he says you can trick your body into becoming more empathetic, which is very different from educating your mind to understanding what racism and sexism are. Right? It's not about knowledge, understanding, um, uh, thinking, but really more about sensation. Um, hence, we need this. Um, users can encounter a racial other, a crying child, a black teenager shot on the street. So. Here's more about this. Um, disrupt interpersonal oppression, discrimination, and your misperceptions. So you see these titles like um, One Dark Night, which uses actual audio from the Trayvon Martin shooting um, to immerse you in the experience of being a witness to this. Um, uh, yes, problematic, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, and it ignores the actual women and people of color who have been speaking loudly about their experiences all this time. And that's what this symposium is going to be about, which I think is great. We're actually going to focus on that as opposed to white receptions of these things. So programmers need to have clear and flexible definitions of racism and sexism before creating, patching, or marketing products. Ethnic and women's studies have been producing these intellectual resources for years running alongside the history of digital technology from the 60s onwards and in the book I'm writing, I'm tracing the way that tech and race co-evolved during the same period, or rather tech, tech and women of color feminism, but also a lot of the third world liberation movements, ethnic studies was coming up at the same time the internet was coming up. Um, these networks were very imbrica imbricate, imbricated within each other, even though they sound very antithetical. It was a cheap labor of women of color in other countries that allowed technology to become popular because it allowed it to become cheap. And cheapness is what made it attainable and what made it hegemonic. Um, so academics and other fields have not been doing a very good job talking about race and technology. But then again, why would they? That is not their focus. Ethnic studies and women's studies, on the other hand, do exactly this. Um, and academe, like tech, is suffused with racism and sexism masquerading as meritocracy. Right? I think the USC event really kind of proved that. The idea that um, universities are about rewarding hard work and you know, innovation and labor and all that, I think we know that's really not true. Um, so women of color feminist theory provides answers to these questions. Um, I wanted to talk about this one really briefly too, because when women of color do intervene in the space, and Hyphen Labs is a woman of color collective who make virtual reality, where they just represent women of color, they are persistently misread as making the viewer into a black woman. So this notion that VR, again, exceeds the rational, exceeds the kind of epistemological, but is experiential, is like emotional. Um, even the BBC, which usually does a little better job, has been kind of falling into this discourse, which tech has kind of put out there like breadcrumbs for journalists, right? Um, so uh, many of the landmark figures in women of color feminism have a lateral relationship to the academy. Um, which I believe we have to, right? Uh, so many of its founding figures, Audre Lorde, Gloria Anzaldúa, Cherry Moraga, other members of the Third World Women's Alliance, and I would say they're kind of um, daughters and granddaughters who are in the movement now and working on different kinds of platforms, define themselves first as teachers and poets. I think that's really important. They are makers, um, not necessarily critics first, but very much like designers. They're producing experiences for people. Um, they are not uh, uh, necessarily part of this in-group of scholars. Um, they're used to reaching broad audiences using a multiplicity of pedagogical modes. So music, art, um, uh, performance, they're academic second. So Audre Lorde, um, you always have to end with an Audre Lorde quote, it seems, and I just had to do it. Um, this is from learning from the 60s, 1984. So I'm hoping we can learn from the 80s in 2019. Uh, she encouraged us to reclaim the future, and if tech is about anything, it's about the future, right? For tech, the present is always the future, never the past. Um, encouraged us to reclaim the future as a collective, which
which is a radical departure from the way technology views all solutions as individual solutions. So empathy and ethics are both individual choices. Um, even though you're tricking your body into being empathetic, it's still something that you consent to do. Um, this means collectives of women of color, which I see coming into being and gathering strength across all forms of social media, um, need to be involved in decisions about technology. These decisions have been made individually in garages, basements, dorm rooms sometimes, but they need to be made collectively. For example, review boards that include people of color, queer folk, people who are non-normative, um, are very different from regulation, which is what I think is in the future or is being proposed for these technologies. So um, including the people who will use them as part of the decision makers about how it will work, um, doing this before the technology is out there, and doing it um, in a collective way, I think, is really vital. Trusting people to educate themselves, to self-regulate, or even to perceive what racism and sexism are when no one has ever talked to them about these things is not probably going to result in anything different from what we have now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, thank you to the folks who invited us here today and put on this fantastic event. And then also, I always want to use the first few moments of my talk to thank folks that don't get thanked, which are the people who make universities run. There are reasons that we're able to sit in these rooms. There are reasons why our rooms are clean and prepared. There are reasons why universities are built and established and founded. And a lot of the folks who build and establish and found those universities are not the people who get to attend them. So I want to begin every talk that I give by always um, recognizing the privilege that it is that we sit in the room and are able to have these kinds of conversations. Um, I wonder if you'll indulge me for a few moments of transparency. Uh, when I first uh, received the invitation to speak um, at this plenary, I had two very divergent thoughts. Uh, the first one is, yes, my work does focus on issues of race and gender and digital communication. So at first pass, this makes good sense. Um, but when you drill down to it, I mean, uh, I write about like Cardi B and ratchetry, like this is the things that I do. And I haven't studied issues of toxicity and harassment or even interracial discourse online since graduate school. The last project where I set out to talk about hate speech online, I was working with Dana Chapman, who's now at Oregon, and we were knee deep in Obama era colorblind politics, reading message boards on major news sites in our graduate program, likely sitting in Dr. Papakarisi's class at the time. And <laughs> uh, we wanted to consider those news sites and think about how uh, colorblind rhetoric was happening in those spaces and how people weren't really talking about race. I think we made it about two weeks into that coding project. This was the year 2010. And what we saw and what we learned in that moment was that the days of post-racial rhetoric <laughs> were behind us. Um, the anger and the vitriol and the hate that we collected and that we sat with was a little too much for our life station at that moment. Uh, at the same time, I was collecting for a project uh, with two colleagues at the University of Illinois Chicago where we were looking at the execution of Troy Davis, who was killed here in uh, the state of Texas. So imagine with me for a moment, if you will, a very young graduate student, black woman, who came to graduate school to study race and media, yes, but who was knee deep now in hours and hours of coding hate and violence and terror, not in an abstract way, but that was being levied against the black men and women and community that I called friend and brother and husband and father. So this toxic world was very different, though, than the one that I was living in online at the time. I thought, where was my world of joy and laughter and resistance and the ratchetry, hashtag uh, uh, Andre Brock's work, um, in the literature? Why were the methods and the theories that I encountered so much better equipped to make hate visible, but do very little to radically reimagine race online? So I've spent the last six years or so focused on intraracial discourse and rhetoric within the African American community. So when I was asked to sit on the panel, I hesitated a moment because I thought what I have to offer here from my lane, because I very much believe in lanes, um, is different than what I thought the organizers might actually want. 
And then I thought, um, I told you I had two thoughts, right? That was the first thought. And the second thought was, if you are ever asked in your life to sit next to Lisa Nakamura and Zizi Papakarisi on a panel, you just say yes. And so here I am. Um, so in all honesty, it's one of the great privileges of my career thus far to be able to share space with these visionary women who are so impactful in my work. Um, look, Mama, I made it. Um, but back to scholarly things. So um, Zizi talked quite a bit about, uh, and to journalists, and Lisa talked quite a bit to developers and programmers, and I guess I fashioned my talk a little bit to talk to researchers and scholars a little about how we are thinking about race and toxicity online. And so I want to talk about three brief things. Um, one is hashtag feminism. And um, one is digital black feminism. And then finally, I'd like to talk about how black women will not save us because, quite frankly, you can't afford it. Um, so the phrases, listen to black women and ask black women, have become very popularized post the election of the 45th president, where black women as a group voted collectively less in lower numbers than any other group for the person who was elected by the Electoral College. Um, on cable news, though, and in the national newspapers, we've been inundated for two years with liberal and progressive politicians and writers who have been lamenting the Democratic Party's inability to reach white working class men. Uh, in fact, even as the 2020 campaign gears up and new folks throw their hat in the ring every day, uh, some folks are still insisting that the greatest malfeasance of the Democratic Party is its inability to reach white men. And I'm not here to give a talk, obviously, about presidential politics or party tactics. I just kind of find it odd that this is how we have chosen to spend our time. Rather than trying to figure out how to maintain and grow what is clearly the most reliable base of a party, we're talking about who we didn't hit. Exposed to the same rhetoric in 2016, often having the same economic anxiety, black women, despite Russian propaganda and despite fake news, did the radical work of choosing to once again make decisions that may not be their first choice, but what they saw as potentially their only decision for the greater good of the country. So Twitter users keep reminding a public that black women try to save America from itself, but these catchphrases lauding black women for their decision-making abilities do not do the work of explaining the centuries of wisdom and labor and ingenuity that have put black women in a position to have to do the long-suffering and thankless work that attempts to save America from itself. So rather than focusing on why a large portion of the country could be fooled by Russian bots on Twitter, perhaps we should be asking the black women who were not. We should be potentially talking to black women who are on Twitter and are on Facebook, who are on social media and make use of it at higher rates than most other groups because they certainly are exposed to trolls and they're exposed to bots and they're exposed to fake news stories. And let's be honest, the real news stories that do the same kind of propaganda work that sometimes fake news stories do. So what if politicians and writers ask black women why they cast their vote for the winner of the popular vote? What if we as scholars inquired about the social media practices of black women that do not inculcate them from exposure, but provide them a skill set to navigate trolling and hate speech online? What if we tried to learn a history of black women's use of technology and their long honed skills in intra and inter cultural communicative practice that better equips them to be purveyors of social media, making decisions for both themselves and the larger society? I mean, are black women actually just magic? The phrase black girl magic became a really popular hashtag and rallying cry to celebrate the everyday ways that black women thrive in spite of the boundaries that are erected to keep them from doing such. The originator of the phrase, her name is Kashawn Thompson, and she's explained that this phrase, black girl magic, wasn't meant to be something that pointed out exemplars of business or celebrity success or out of the ordinary moments. Rather, I mean, even though the phrase was used at the Oscars and at the Super Bowl halftime, right, the point of black girl magic was to indicate the ordinary, everyday kinds of magic that is just existing as a black woman in society. It was, as the old church-going saints would say, making a way out of no way. But black women were doing things that white Western culture was deeply committed to teaching us we were incapable of doing. So this phrase, black girl magic, I have a love-hate relationship with. Um, I sat in an academic conference last year where there was a panel on this topic, on this hashtag, and I thought, oh good, 
um, we're going to have a group of scholars that's going to deeply interrogate the complexity of black women online, the digital skills they possess, their communicative histories, potentially issues of labor and joy and how these things become intertwined in digital space. I mean, clearly, they're going to use black girl magic as the shorthand, right, so that they could dive in deeply into the ideas that they want to talk about. That didn't happen. Um, and instead, I think what is happening with this phrase and with a lot of other shorthand phrases is that some of us have decided to use shorthand in place of our theory. Rather than the shorthand ushering a populace into a complex conversation about the history of black women's labor and how joy becomes magic, it becomes the shorthand guiding the research and the researchers. Sarah Florini, I hope that she doesn't mind. I am going to talk about her for a moment. She doesn't like when I talk about her, but she's amazing. Um, she has a book coming out next year called Beyond Hashtags, uh, where she talks about a network of black digital content producers and how that exploration is actually generative, precisely because the way we use social media is not relegated to individual platforms. Yet as researchers, that's how we study it. We sit and study Twitter, or we study Facebook, or we study Instagram, but none of us use, has, new, use um, platforms in isolation. So that exclusive focus for me on Twitter, and more specifically on hashtags, is really kind of extended at this point. Black girl magic isn't indicative of some supernatural, inexplicable power possessed by black women. Black girl magic is shorthand for centuries of practice that black women have at doing everything for everyone while maintaining dignity and not sweating out their edges. So I was and remain frustrated with how what was meant to be an in-group celebration of black women has turned into another opportunity, in fact, to diminish the intellectual curiosity, technical skill, and communicative genius of black women. I do understand our desire as researchers to understand black folks' use of social media and to use Twitter and to use hashtags to do so. I recently did a study with a colleague about expressions of black joy on Vine and Twitter where we collected images and pictures and sounds from those media platforms using a couple of hashtags. It's useful, right? It's a really good attempt and neat way and succinct way to bound our studies. Um, I'm not suggesting it doesn't have merit. But I am saying there's a serious limitation here that we as researchers should be concerned with. Because being consumed by this hashtag descriptive research, especially in pursuit of issues of racial justice and critical cultural work, doesn't lead to the most rich opportunity to uncover and dismantle systemic inequality and instead might actually feed, as Lisa suggested, toxicity and violence online. So moving beyond the hashtag, a deep engagement with technoculture is what I propose that produces a nuanced view of black feminist praxis and principles as shaped through and by the digital. Black feminist technoculture presents us a lens through which that we can understand the possibilities of digital technology by severing the cord from the white supremacist and patriarchal origins of the technology that we study and use every day. Andre Brock, who's here, labels black cyber culture as digital practice and artifacts informed by a black aesthetic, differentiating techno-culture, which he considers to be a combination of whiteness and modern technological beliefs. Black cyber culture, he argues, arises from the aesthetic and the libidinal, the ability of black folks to interject pleasure and joy into technology from a black experience, which is often, far often considered one of just pain and deprivation. And this critical intervention by Brock is really useful because it asks us to consider what black folks mean to technology and how the unique experiences of black folks are transposed into their relationship with technology. So building on this logic, I assert that digital black feminism might be uniquely suited to undercut the reach and power of white cyber culture. If techno culture is embedded with white ideology, with patriarchy, with misogyny, then black feminist techno culture is its undoing. So my articulation of black digital feminism, digital black feminism, excuse me, is the project of combining the work of three women. Patricia Hill Collins' Matrix of Domination, Anna Everett's Black Technophilia, and Joan Morgan's Hip Hop Feminism. I intentionally draw upon the matrix of domination rather than the term intersectionality here. Uh, Lisa and I were just talking about this this morning. But the term intersectionality has gotten really popular in the last few years, God bless, right? Um, but what that's led to is a misuse, right? With people thinking about individual components of their identities rather than systemic mechanisms of oppression that function in interlocking ways over the lives of uh, groups of people. 
So black women's unique experience with oppression and resistance shapes their ability to understand and utilize communicative technologies that are both digital and analog. And I think the matrix of domination serves us better in having that conversation. So moving beyond hashtags, uh, I consider black women and black feminist thought online as more than just a possible output, more than a space to fight for representation of marginalized communities in an otherwise white male dominated arena. Instead, the extension of and limitations of digital black feminism online, this work requires us to shift from thinking about black women at the margins of technology to being at the center. We're recalibrating our notions of technology and of feminism not as a product of whiteness. Instead, seeing whiteness as a limitation on the possibilities of both digital technology and feminism. The possibilities of technology, the limitations, the futures, the histories are all reconsidered through the lens of black feminist technoculture. So I want to close our talk, because I'm trying to stay on time, by uh, thinking about why we can't afford to have black women save us. Um, I say this potentially for a different reason than you might think. Because I just said, you know, black women, listen to black women, right? But no. Uh, there are five rhetorical moves in my work that I study that uh, emerge from this new digital black feminist culture. Uh, I don't have time to talk in depth about each of them today, but each one works at undermining systems of hate and toxicity online and oppression. Those five are the prioritization of agency, the right to self-identify, advocacy of a non-gender binary space of discourse, advocacy of complicated allegiances, and a dialectic of self and community interests. Um, you might notice, depending on your familiarity with black feminist thought, that those would not probably be the first five rhetorical moves that you think that black feminists would be using online. But I argue that their interpol the interpolation with the digital has consequences. And this is one of those consequences, is that the rhetorical moves by black feminists have shifted as a result. A colleague of mine, Jessica Liu, who does brilliant rhetorical and historical work on the Freedmen's Bureau, considers how rhetorics of freedom were established in the antebellum South and how these constructions were intentionally crafted as both aspirational for newly freed black slaves, but also impossible to reach, therefore cementing into place these goals that black folks had to reach in order to become full citizens to attain their full freedom rights that they knew full well at the time were impossible to reach. It is really, really important work on this. And as I was reflecting on her work, I'm thinking about uh, the relationship that we have between a modern rhetoric of freedom, what we tell folks now about what they need in order to be free and how that relates to our technology and our democracy. The reason I began in the start of this talk advocating for inquiry beyond the hashtag is that while the hashtag listen to black women is important, it's important that we move past that to actually complicate the kinds of relationships that black folks and specifically black women who we're looking to for all of this wisdom, right? what that relationship actually does to the people who have the relationship, what kinds of expectations and aspirations it poses, and what kind of limitations on their own freedom it actually allows for. So much in the same way that newly emancipated, emancipated slaves were told that property ownership and voting and education were the pathways toward their own freedom, we now read millions of articles every day about how the future for black folks is coding, right? And that only, if only, if only these communities would learn the coding and the tech, then that would be the point of their freedom. As an aside, black women who don't code still learn and know a lot about technology, but that's another talk for a different day. Um, digital technology as freedom is a problem, right? I think we've kind of established, and that's the whole point of this race and toxicity workshop. It has more than a few flaws. But beyond the toxicity component, digital to technology also has led to a form of black feminism that is commodified. So if black feminism is to save us, what does it mean when, that, when black feminism becomes a product of digital technology? Can it still have the same revolutionary and liberatory power? Black feminism as a commodity means that the words and actions of black women now have a monetary value within this digital ecosystem. And I am here and happy for black women to get paid for the kind of free labor that has been poured into the maintenance of US democracy and technology for generations. But black feminism as a commodity has limitations. It has limits. What does it mean for any of us, for our advocacy, for our activism, for our pursuit of freedom and justice to become part of an all-consuming digital economy? So when I say we can't afford for black women to save us, I mean both literally right, and, and figuratively. Black feminists are monetizing their expertise, and rightly so. But converting black feminism into a product might be a price that is far too high for any of us to pay in real time. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you to all our speakers. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions, as I said, of them, and then I'm going to open up to you all because um, we want to stay on time, and I really would love to have you to have a chance to address questions. But my first question, and, and this is going to be directed, direct, directed at ZZ, um, and this wasn't on the list I sent you, so I apologize. But uh, your, t your talk prompted in me a question. You know, I was really intrigued when you were talking about, you know, journalists and Trump and how, you know, they're just handling the situation wrong and, and that they should be focusing on their investigative work and they shouldn't be, like, catering to every little thing he does in every press conference. Um, and I totally agree with that. I love your quote, resist the tyranny of the narrative. Um, why aren't they doing that in your mind? Uh, economics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I think there are systemic reasons that um, are keeping them from that, from doing that. Um, is, I think it's a very a long answer. I'll, I'll try to give a very short one. I okay. think for, for many decades we've been seeing changes in journalism that have led to the situation that we're dealing with now. Some of them have to do with the sort of, you know, mainstreaming of news and um, uh, incorporating local journalism into these larger outlets. Then changes in, in the newsroom itself that have to do with the form that the attention economy has taken on now. You know, the, the attention economy has always been part of the news ecology. Um, it's never been absent, but mm -hmm. it's taken on a different form and has placed uh, editors in the newsroom in a very different position. Um, they're saying very different things and tasking uh, uh, journalists with very different sort of um, responsibilities. Um, and news culture is changing a little bit. And um, I mean, this whole business of, of covering Trump in in the way that they have been, has been very profitable for a lot yeah. of, for the New York Times, for CNN, you know, has dug them out of a, pulled them out of a black hole. Um, so there's, I think, a, a very strong financial incentive to not do that uh, and to just sort of keep covering the news the way that, um, and these events, you know, letting them, letting them turn into the stories that they mm -hmm. have been turning into that invite this form of toxicity. Yeah, thank you. I, that, that's a helpful answer. I mean, it's, it's a little troubling as we head into a next ele election cycle that there really doesn't seem to be a change in that, which is a fundamental issue. My next question is for Lisa. And again, this was not on the list I sent you, but was prompted by what you said. You know, you said this a couple times that, you know, that there is racism and sexism endemic in the platforms and the algorithms, and that you don't think it's conscious or intentional. And I totally agree with you that it's endemic and systemic in these, but I wonder sometimes if at least a little bit of it is intentional. <laughs> and I wondered if you could expand on that. Because it feels like, my gosh, how could it not be intentional sometimes? Uh -huh. Yeah, um, clearly there's a lot of intentional racism around. Like You only need to play video games and engage in those cultures to see there's you know, very purposeful decisions by designers to exclude female avatars or to make avatars all one race and to be very, you know, conservative about conserving or kind of pre preserving the culture of video games, which is white and male. So I've seen this interesting use of indigenous theory to kind of justify why fighting games should be so misogynist because they say it's our culture mm -hmm. and you're imposing something else from the outside, which is not authentic and is like overstepping, you know, the kind of respect for our subculture. Um, so, I mean, that's another hallmark of the 21st century, I think, is appropriating the kind of speech and discourse of social movements to do conservative work, right? Um, so, uh, I, I certainly agree that a lot of it is intentional, but I think the most important kinds of um, racism often are not just unintentional, but are structural and are effectively hidden from us, mm -hmm. right? So um, Joy Bulamini's work on the way that Facebook has been serving ads to people based on what they think is their race and gender, um, you know, the way databases are populated, which seem to be automatic, but, you know, certainly scrape data from people who are not as good at hiding their data as people who are able to hide their data, who understand their data differently. Um, the, I think that the, the kind of logic of capture, which is what these industries do, 
um, is indiscriminate on purpose, right? The idea is to create big data, and the bigger, the better. Therefore, it is not, it's like the opposite of discriminatory, or dis discriminating or protective. It becomes very kind of global and therefore pretty victimizing, you know? So the amount of personal data that Facebook has is a direct result of the way Facebook works, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's not an aberration. It's exactly the structure of Facebook. And I think that's true of, of all of these social media companies, right? That's, that's the premise of how they work. So why would they not reproduce that value? Mm -hmm of capture, capitalize, um, kind of section up into saleable kinds of groups of people. So journalism does this very well. Right? It knows who its audience is, and it speaks to that audience, and so on. And it has a lot of data about us. Um, so uh, I think um, programmers are, are very aware of this, right? Um, I th as I mentioned, the strikes at Microsoft, I think that's not the last of that kind of thing. I mean, programmers are often very liberal people. So people have wondered, how can you have such great liberal people who are Democrats and anti-racist and went to good liberal arts colleges doing this? Like, how mm -hmm. is this happening? That's how it's happening, yeah. right? Um, the way that people are made to program pur pur purposely conceals the result from the very people who are doing it. So. OK, thank you so much. Um, we are going to shift a little bit here because there's some students in the audience who need to leave at 10.45, um, which I did not realize. So we're going to let them ask some questions, um, and then we'll get back to what we're doing. Go ahead. Um, hi, thank you all so much for uh, this amazing uh, plenary. Um, I'm a PhD student in Latinx studies, and so I'm tackling this digital subcultures from the ethnic studies angle. Um, and my um, research right now has to do with uh, men of color who engage in the manosphere. Mm. And so um, I'm really interested in this uh, approach of women of color feminism to disrupting um, larger platforms mm -hmm. like Facebook and YouTube. But how do we how do we approach more of these siloed communities? Um, like certain forums, certain Reddit thread, uh, subreddits, where it's really easy to get like immersed in sexist and racist content, um, where um, larger platforms have less control of the way that those forums work. Well, I think the first piece is like recognizing the amount of control that platforms actually do have over what happens um, in their spaces, mm -hmm. and we've I, we've I think it's easy you might talk about this. We've we've kind of allowed for the fact that things just kind of happen and this is just kind of the way that things are. And there has to be kind of a fundamental re-questioning of whether or not that that's true, just at the base of the question, right? Mm -hmm. Of whether or not platforms actually don't have any say so in what happens in their platform mm -hmm. and whether or not platforms aren't actually decide, designed, I would say, with that in mind, right? And so I think that that was a really useful kind of question that, mm -hmm. that you tackle, Lisa, about whether or not it's designed or it's on purpose because Separating race from misogyny and separating race from capital is how we get to say that, that racism isn't on purpose. Because if we put them back together, we put them back in the same conversation. If the goal of platforms is money making and is hyper capitalist, then the goal of platforms can't be divorced from white supremacy and patriarchy as well. And so if the goal of a platform is that kind of hyper capitalism, then it is embedded deeply designed and on purpose to actually manifest things that keep capital alive. And what keeps capitalism thriving in our country are reliances on issues of misogyny and on racism. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a fundamental shift we have to make to questioning whether or not these platforms are actually doing things, doing this with, with those kinds of ideas in mind to start out with. Uh, can I, is there time for me to add one short oh, comment yes, to that? Oh, yes, please do. Um, yes, I think for a long time we were pretending like this is a very difficult problem to yeah. solve. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, while it is complex, I don't think it's impossible. And whenever we talk about um, the question of, you know, regulating content, we bump into this like oversimplified understanding of, of free speech, right. which I think is prevalent, especially in the United States. We don't encounter the same understanding in other countries that take a more firm stance on, on the idea of regulation. But the bottom line is that if you want to call yourself a democracy, if you want to say that you're a platform that exists in a democratic society, you simply cannot create the circumstances that allow for that type of speech, for that kind of content, 
to exist, mm -hmm. to be present, mm -hmm. to be visible. I mean, I think, you know, and I'm going to use a very light metaphor, uh, but in soccer, you know, mm -hmm. when you engage in uncivil behavior, you get a yellow card, mm -hmm. then you get a red card. I, and again, I don't mean to oversimplify complex societal issues, systemic problems, but I mean, if we've solved that problem in soccer, which also has its <laughs> own <laughs> complex <laughs> set of, I, I'm sure that we can find, you know, we can't resort to this just cheap excuse of, mm -hmm. you know, we can't, uh, you know, ban free speech for all. Mm -hmm. uh, equality and freedom are two distinct concepts. We have to treat them as separate. I wanted to say something about your research, which sounds fascinating. You know, you would think it's very counterintuitive. Why would people of color want to engage in the manosphere? But after hearing these papers, it seems to me to speak to the kind of attractiveness mm -hmm. or affective charge of experiencing racism online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that itself is a profitable thing to do. Yes. So I worry very much as a researcher when the, the news media reports on this egregious thing that happened to someone online, and I read it eagerly and I think, wait, yes. you know, I've just become part of the, the, mm -hmm. the issue here. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing about Reddit people don't realize. They, they call it um, hate reading, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, go ahead. In terms of being a black woman and also a millennial who is active in the digital community in terms of social media, with the movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter and Black Girl Magic, and with society believing that we should save them as black women, how do you suggest just normal students react to like stray away from it? Because I, I always say like, it's not my job to teach other people what it's like to be a black woman. But how can you, I guess like, word it and like what record do you need to show like you're in support of these things because you identify with them, but you're not going to take time and continuously try to teach them and make them understand what it's like to be. Yeah. I, I run into this um, in my Twitter life where I'm, I'm just me, right, uh, existing in spaces and I, I almost say sometimes it's not my job to, and I remember like, oh, like literally it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> different problem. But, um, but there are moments where it's not uh, that, that labor, because it is, right? It's labor that people are ask, asking of you to perform in particular spaces, and it's choice, right? And, and recognizing that there is choice to perform labor in certain circumstances and not in others. There are folks for whom my labor is, is useful and for whom I think it's useful for me to perform the labor, and there are folks for whom it's not. My classroom is a space where I find it really useful to perform that labor, not just because it's my literal job, but because there's folks there who are interested in, in that knowledge. And those spaces exist online as well, right? Where folks are interested in that knowledge and you don't see it as something that is taking away from you. I do want to say quickly, we have to really be careful about this notion of like black women's labor and being paid for everything that we do online. It's a separate conversation that we might have maybe some more at the workshop, but this monetization and like commodity, commodification of everything that we, every task that we perform online has really bad consequences down the run that maybe we're not thinking about right now while we're just trying to get coin for like doing the things we do. So, thank you. Any other questions for our panelists? Oh, go ahead. put on uh, students who are interested in these things and invested in these kinds of discussions to either go outside of the department to find that rhetoric or to do their own type of, you know, alternative work on this. Um, so just, you know, in terms of both, like, all three of you and, like, your history of how you came to, like, actually get to the complexities, whether or not you have advice on how to start that as a young scholar. <laughs> I, you know what, um, I, can't, I can't say, I, I don't think there's like a magic, magic <laughs> word or like a magic advice. I, um, I, I would agree, I agree, with, I agree with you that in the sense that I, the reason why I decided to become an academic and an educator is that I felt that this, it was through this path I would have the opportunity to educate people about these things. Now, in terms of doing that sort of research, um, 
Well, I, I mean, I would, I would advise to, to be imaginative and um, to protect yourself, but also to not be afraid um, to delve into conversations that sound scary. I think all of us at different points in our lives had the experience of, you know, taking deep dives into toxic conversations online and analyzing them. And for a variety of different reasons, they have been, uh, they've been painful um, to read. And part of the, I, I suppose, part of the practice, you know, the process of becoming a scholar is you, in order to, you know, present what's labeled <laughs> for good or bad, you know, a scientific <laughs> or scholarly analysis, you have to learn to separate uh, what you're analyzing from who you are and that, you know, it's never really possible, <laughs> but you have to find some way to, um, to do the analysis that you're going to do, to do the interpretive work that you're going to do, and to come up with some kind of recommendations that are meaningful to others, but to also at the same time, you know, be the person who you are, so that you have an identity that's, um, it's part of the many different things that you are, not just the, the scholar. I think that's also the part, a, a way for you to be closer to your students and helpful to your students. I, yeah. yeah, I think that's great advice. Also, something that you and I were talking about earlier is to resist description, mm -hmm. because it's so tempting to see something egregious or something you don't think anybody knows about and want to catalog it and then kind of stop there. But I think we had a golden age of black feminism, women of color feminism in the 80s, because people were willing and interested in bigger questions around structure. Mm -hmm. So rather than looking at specific poems or specific things that happened or historical moments, it was about trying to understand the kind of matrices of domination or you know, bigger, more theoretical questions about how these things continue to duplicate themselves over time. Um, and I think we're in a new golden age of, of digital feminism, right? Of, of black feminism, broadly speaking, as a kind of public thing. I think centering somewhat around Beyonce and the Lemonade syllabus, like people do know who Audre Lorde is. So um, if that's, uh, I think also when you're writing on digital media, you have to write for the ages, right? Um, a lot of the things I wrote about in the 90s totally don't exist anymore. <laughs> Lambda <laughs> Moo is totally gone. But I think it's still OK. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you can pull an idea or a theory or a claim or an argument out of it, no one will remember or care that the thing you wrote about Twitch, like in 10 years, I doubt that's going to be the same. <laughs> um, and you know, even Twitter has changed a lot, as you said, since 2010. Um, don't focus so much on the object, I think, but on the things that it enables you to say about how power works, about how identity works, and so on. And I, I heard, I think I heard in your question also this, this idea of how in graduate school, if other folks aren't doing the same kind of work oh. that you're doing, or if folks aren't teaching classes on what you want to be you know, studying, how do you still do critical race work in those spaces? And, and the answer is that your classroom is bigger than your program, I mm -hmm. think is the first piece mm -hmm. of that, right? That like finding your people and your spaces where those kinds of critical conversations are happening is really important. And you draw from your program and from your training the skills to be able to take into those digital conversations about race if that's not what's happening in your program. You still draw the mechanisms to approach theory and to approach method from your program to do that critical work. You know, to Lisa's point about um, the descriptive work, I think that there's so much descriptive work happening around um, race and social media, specifically around black Twitter right now, because a lot of folks are isolated in programs where writing descriptive work is potentially the only kind of work that's happening around black folks in digital spaces. And so it feels um, good to do that. And they're maybe getting accolades that like this is new or different, right? There's lots of reasons maybe why this descriptive work is happening. but. Um, Pushing past that back into those critical spaces requires an engagement potentially with folks outside of who you learn with every day. And also, I think probably all of us have had a little resistance to our work, especially when we were younger. So if people don't like it, fine. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that could be good, right? Resistance is often a sign of mm -hmm. something happening, right? Of somebody reacting strongly yeah. to what you're saying. And often those are defensive reactions. We probably have time for just one more question. If there's any other questions from the audience, I oh go ahead. Hi, 
Hi, so my name is Morgan. I'm actually coming down from Chicago. I go to the Northwestern, I'm a sociology PhD student. So, and my dissertation is on um, the harassment of women in online spaces, which is fun and not traumatizing in the slightest. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, yeah, I guess for everyone, but for um, Lisa in particular, um, when you said we have to focus as a solution on input versus regulation, um, I feel like, so what would be uh, the motivation for putting a queer or black woman on a panel? Or like on a on a advisory board or something? Because then you're relying on the charity of these developers, which liberal, libertarian, debatable. Um, I still remember that Google guy, don't remember his name, just remember what he wrote, who got fired. He did get fired pretty promptly, but it still took a bit longer than you would like. Mm -hmm. Everyone remembers the Google guy. Mm -hmm. I forgot what his yeah, name is. Yeah. Racist, racist Google guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, are there anything in between these uh, forums or advisory boards and regulation that wouldn't rely on the one hand versus regulation, which is, takes a very long time, versus the advisory board, which relies on the charity of debatably liberal white men? Right. Well, I don't think that these companies can create their own advisory boards because, first of all, people are quitting. Mm -hmm. So, anybody who really would have something to say, refuses to serve on them. We, I think a bunch of people quit recently mm -hmm. because they know that these are limited kinds of influence they can have and that they're kind of a fig leaf for bigger problems that the industry has. So if they can say, I have an advisory board with these people on it, it somehow is a kind of defense against other kinds of attacks. I think what I mean is something a lot more, um, a lot more uh, advocacy driven, right? And certainly not something that tech industries create on their own, right? I mean. When I teach video game history, I'm always amazed that the Video Game Ratings Association was created by the video game industry. You know? So the ESRB's ratings really are self-ratings, and that doesn't work. It's not really regulation. It's more kind of like flagging or something like that, or resistance to regulation. Right? It's a kind of regulation which defies regulation. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know what form that would take, but I think um, uh, uh, Advocates have a role to play who are not from within. I think that, that definitely needs to happen. And there are models for this in other countries for sure. Um, right now in Berlin, they kicked Google out of there. They, Berlin wanted, they wanted to open a Google office in Berlin, and they were kind of kicked out of there. And San Francisco's kicked Amazon out. So I know people can organize around these things when they want to. But they've been given, given very little um, kind of impetus or support to do so. So I think scaffolding that kind of ability for people to organize um, and giving them some some resources to do that is probably a way forward anyway yeah i would only add that um you know a small part of the fault lies with us in academia because we train people to do very specific things. So we produce engineers, and they're very different from sociologists, and they're very different from philosophers. And then we also make them go to a school for four years and get into a lot of debt. And <laughs> one of my <laughs> favorite things to talk about lately is that college doesn't have to be four years. You know, you, maybe it can be a different experience that's shorter. Uh, and there, therefore, we open the way for these companies to hire for engineers and then uh, what ends up happening, you know, the prevailing t uh, tendency in um, all the Silicon Valleys of the world is to hire for engineers, pay them uh, handsomely, frequently hire, you know, just uh, engineering BAs and give them these insane salaries. Yet when they hire social scientists, and they've been hiring a lot of social scientists in Facebook lately, the social scientists actually have to have a PhD <laughs> to be hired, and they make a lot less. For me, it would be much more meaningful for companies to hire something that might be called a social engineer uh, and follow that right, you know, the, that, that route. Uh, the idea of hiring the engineer and overpaying them, to me, sounds as ludicrous as uh, wanting to build a building and hiring a civil engineer and paying them more than the architect. That sort of, you know, metaphor, that yeah. sort of analogy. We are going to have to stop here because we're going to get kicked out of the room. But thank you all for coming. And thanks again to our speakers.